and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. No, I am not making a 420 joke. That's too easy. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming to us straight from Dream Pod Nine, and is and one of the peop and the head man and the line developer of the Heavy Gear RPG, which is not which is making its grand, glorious comeback. The one and only Nick Heisman. How you doing today, man? Pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Enjoying the day. It's uh, storming. It's hailing. Yeah, we're doing fine. Yep. And by the way, congratulations on managing to get. Get to get significantly past your goal with plenty of time to spare. Since at the time of this recording, it's at fifty six point three Canadian, and the goal was forty thousand Canadian. Yes, thank you. That's a uh, load off my shoulders. Mm -hmm. I don't think I slept the night before we put that live. I'd be lying if I said I hadn't heard that kind that kind of tale many a time. But yeah. I'd like to op I'd like to open up with the humble beginnings in a sense. Um, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. So my first experience with role playing games would be back in two thousand and five, something like that. Um, I was actually a miniature gamer first, still am. Uh, play all the miniature games, and I was miniatures with a friend and they said hey we need somebody else for a DD campaign this would have been 3.5 i think i said yes and that was a terrible mistake because i've never been able to quite stop since um i've hopped around across multiple systems a lot of it comes down to having a good group to play with and all of that so i dropped off for a fair bit and then came back around the middle of the last decade if i finally getting a group that i actually enjoyed playing with we were kind of all on the same page and from there, that just led to me playing more RPGs, going through, sampling a bunch of them, and then I actually got involved with the development of the Heavy Gear uh, miniature game side, originally. And when they wanted to do the RPG, they tapped me for it and said, hey, you want to do this? Mm -hmm. I said, sure. And that was two and a half years ago. So, with the, with that in mind... Um... Were you were you before you got tapped to work to work on Blitz? Were you familiar with he, with Heavy Gear up up to that point? And what was your introduction to it? My introduction to Heavy Gear was in 1999 with a computer game by the name of Heavy Gear. Mm -hmm. um, if you've heard the name Heavy Gear before, and that that actually might be one of the places where you've heard it. So the um, IP has actually had two video games and a TV show. But it was that very first computer game. It was over at a friend's house. We were kind of giant robot fanatics. This was about the time that the original English airing of Mobile Suit Gundam was on Toonami. Mm -hmm. So we were all kind of on, on the hype train for giant robots. Fantastic. Here's a video game of giant robots beating the crap out of each other. And that was my first exposure to the IP. I then promptly forgot it existed by the year 2000 or 2001. It wasn't until probably 2009 that I became aware that Heavy Gear was more than just video games. I encountered the miniature game through just internet playing different miniature games and going on and um, going across the internet communities. Um, there was a there still is a YouTube channel. They're called On the Tabletop now, but they went by Beasts of War about 15 years ago. Yeah, I'm familiar with and, that. Yeah, if you go back to about 2010, they did a bunch of previews for Heavy Gear stuff, and that's kind of like, wait a minute, I recognize this. So I did a little bit of digging. Um, couldn't really get any traction in the area. It also, you know, everybody in my area was playing Warhammer 40k at the time, so, well, mm -hmm. good luck getting that needle out. So, flash forward to about 2013, Heavy Gear announces they are doing a plastic Kickstarter. Um, this was at a time when I was not a fan of metal models or anything like that. It was plastic or bust. I have since developed as a hobbyist since then, but new plastic starters, new version of the rules. Fantastic. Give it a shot. Got it. Great. Cool. Wasn't really able to go forward with it. Um, at the time, the second edition, so it was the second edition of the second version of the tabletop game. Um, 
I don't know who edited that book. I don't really want to know who it is because then I would know who to blame. <laughs> it was painful to read. It was convoluted. There were mechanics that existed for no other reason than existing. There were entire systems where it was like, you know, we're going to call this this or what that that or whatever, and then none of it ever mattered. Mm-hmm. It's just painful to read, painful to process. So put it up. Cool. Great. Not super thrilled about it. 2000 and this would have been 16 or 17 rolls around. And DreamPod 9 does another round of Kickstarters for plastic models. They're going to redo the edition. You know, they got they got a different development guy in there doing it. And they're going to go through a public beta. I'm like, okay, well, one more chance and I can wash my hands of this and pretend I'm done. Mm-hmm. Get the beta. It's better, but that wasn't saying a whole lot. So I'm sitting there in my office at the university. I teach college as, as my day job. And... I'm sitting there in my office. I'm in my office hours. No students are using it because students don't realize apparently that professors are there to answer questions for them. And I print this document out. It's like 100 pages. And I get my red grading pen. And am I allowed to swear on this? Yes. I tore it a new fucking asshole. (laughs) Um, Because the thing is, so my day job is I teach engineering. Mm -hmm. And that is a very complicated subject. And you have to present it in a very specific way to get people to understand it. So I know how to teach people stuff. I know what a good textbook looks like. So I kind of went in with that mentality and just shredded this document. I'm like, okay, well, one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to say thank you, maybe do a couple things, and life goes on. Or maybe just maybe they'll take some of it to heart. Sent it to them, got it back, and they said, hey, you know, basically went through line by line every change, said agree, disagree, here's why. Can you do that again? (laughs) <laughs> and that's that's where the uh, the avalanche started of me ending up to eventually getting involved with the development side of the war game. Uh, mostly just kind of beta testing, editing. Mm-hmm. And then when the RPG came up, got tapped for the RPG, which expanded to also include I am now the lead for story writing. Mm-hmm. So all the fiction, all the storyline stuff goes through me. And now I get to sit in all the development meetings and see things like concept art and production statuses and yeah. It, it, it's been a ride. I don't know how this happened. Uh, I'm reminded of a certain graphic designer who had who had said that the greatest innovations were done by people who had no idea what they were doing. Well, I most certainly I am that. But truth be told, not, truth be told, a lot notice, of people um, accident their way into this kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, I about to say you will notice at no point in that history did I say worked for a company full time or anything like that. So. Yeah, yeah, that happened. No, the way if you've you... seen the if you've seen the meme of like the cow on the billboard and you go, how did I don't know how I got here? That's me. Yeah, like I'm looking down, like how did this happen? And now is that now um when it comes to when it comes to heavy when it comes to heavy gear in particular, um obviously it's it's been around for a while. It had it. While it while it is while it isn't on the up up upper upper echelonist, it's had a dedicated fan base over over the years. Um, what do you what do you suppose is would be some would be some of the things in your in your estimation that draws people in and keeps them in when it comes to heavy gear, whether it be the setting of Terra Nova or the or the rule set or bo- or both and neat both and either. So I think it's a combination of setting and mission statement. So the setting of Heavy Gear, um, just so you know, right now there's like 90-something source books for the older RPG editions. Mm-hmm. And I'm not counting war game releases. I'm talking RPG releases and story content. There aren't a lot of franchises that can boast quite that level of detail. You know, if you're going to compare them to other, you know, kind of mecha franchises, Battletech's about the only one that gets to that level. Yeah. When it comes to just sheer volume of content. So the thing about that, though, is it lets we have a much, much smaller universe than a lot of other science fiction franchises. We are not a space opera like Star Wars. Um, a One of our fans once described Heavy Gear as Tom Clancy meets Armored Trooper Votoms. 
um, Gundam, if you're not familiar with what Votoms is, but Votoms is a yeah. more like grounded, realistic robot thing. Yeah, we're with the Max B. I'd like to say I'd like to say grounded, but give but um, given some of the other things in that OVA as well as a sister one, Armor Hunter. Um, oh yeah, I'm not entirely sure how how far I would go to call it grounded. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. It is a universe where you've got the robots, and the robots are the main combat platform, but the robots are not this invincible killing machine. Okay, I've dealt with Gundam, I've played Battletech, I've done all these other mecha franchises, and they all reduce to Giant Robot is King of Battlefield. And I get it, that's what people are there for. But that's not really realistic. Um, you miss a lot of the support stuff, you miss a lot of what else has to go into a military. Um, the Armor Trooper Votoms reference is not so much a realism perspective, but more just kind of like we're dealing with a lot of political drama and also just the size of the mecha. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the Votoms in there are about the size of ours. But the other big comparison there was Tom Clancy, where we are very much focused on geopolitical drama, intrigue, sociopolitical problems, not armies marching to war and having, you know, gigantic space battles. That that attracts a lot of people and especially when you have a really fleshed out universe, there's a lot of room to tell stories and you can kind of get you can kind of just go in there and start walking off in a random direction and find a story to tell. Yeah. The other thing is I mentioned was a mission statement and it ties into the Tom Clancy idea. If you let us have giant robots, and our robots aren't that big. Like, on the physics-defying scale, they are, they're not that high. And the way we do interstellar travel is basically through wormholes in our universe. Past that, we play by as grounded, realistic rules as we can. If you look at our world, you're going to see, you know, a nation isn't just a unified nation. There are, you know, political structures. How are, how is their political system organized? Mm -hmm. The various political parties and all of that. And that kind of thing isn't abnormal for a lot of IPs, but I was just flipping through an old source book, and I think they mentioned at one point there was one nation that had, like, 11 political parties listed. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, there's 12 of those on the planet that Heavy Gear takes place on, and there's nine other planets. Like, that's an extreme level of detail, interaction... And we're trying to do that within the space of the real, you know, kind of a real world feel. Like, you're not going to see, you know, death cannons or anything like that in our universe. We have warships in space, but it tends to operate more like submarines as opposed to like Star Wars. Mm -hmm. So I think what's kept a lot of our fans, and it's something, you know, talking to people over the years is that heavy gear tends to remain very grounded as much as it can. Like, whenever it's presented with something, it's not fantastic element, it's not super stylized, it's almost gritty, and, you know, it's, oh, gritty's a bad word. Grounded. But it's that, like, grounded, that grounded feel. Um, you know, that, like, 20 minutes in the future on some of this stuff. Um, a, an approach that I've taken when it comes to defining this sort of thing is there is a difference between believability and realism. Mm -hmm. Oh, and true and truth be told, when it comes to it, I pref I will always prefer believability over um, realism. Because trying to trying to go full realistic when you're dealing with something that it that on that by its very nature can't be ends up ends up coming off a bit silly. But if you present something in a way where the audience is willing to go along for the ride, that's the sweet spot. You ever watch a TV series called Babylon 5? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. It's fantastical in its elements, but it, you know, it, if it turned out that in 2,000 years that's how things worked, you know, it's, it's believable. Yeah, it's a little bit crazy. I see what you're saying, and I, I would put Heavy Gear more on the believable scale. Um, it is something that we don't recreate 100% of reality. For example, um... You know, when it comes to just gameplay, we're playing a game. 
Do you want to sit there and track how much fuel your vehicle has, how much ammo you have remaining, and all of the other necessary things to run a 15-foot-tall mech? No. That... Yeah, that tends to kind of like bog the game. Now, we have those details in the universe, but at least when it comes to the gameplay implementation, some of that gets... It's not hand-waved away, but it's not bookkeeping. And I know somebody might I know somebody might off in the distance bring up the simulationist aspects of say Arma, but um, the but the kind of people who play Arma are much like the same people who are going to play the simiest the simmest of racing sims, which are a minority of a minority of a minority. You also have to remember that Arma is a very contrived situation where you've got two forces that are deliberately in contact with each other. In a real world perspective, you know, the majority of soldiers are not in frontline positions, and those majority of the frontline soldiers are not in combat, and they may not even be that close to each other. Like it, even then, it's contriving a situation where that happens. You also don't have to worry about when it comes to armor, like, okay, um, yeah, the entire army only has 110 of those tank units, and you have five of them here. Mm -hmm. Like the, That large-scale logistics gets hand-waved. Like there, there's always some level of hand-waving. And, and I find people who are always like, I want as gritty, like, all of literally every detail to have a gameplay impact, I should emphasize. I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen a game work out like that where it's actually fun. I've seen, I've been in some forums where some, where somebody somebody tries to argue that, and um, what I end up and just to and I'll throw um, I'll throw Phoenix Command, which is my whipping boy when it comes to this when it comes to this sort of thing, at them and and say, okay, I want okay, I want you to run this with with no assists. No, no, this no, you you want you wanted realism here. Here you go. <laughs> and then the, it's a case of the it's a case of yeah, you you may claim that you want that, but until you actually get it. Yeah. And and I would say Heavy Gear is a universe that we have the detail you can go that far with it. It may not always show up in the gameplay, but the universe has all of that there. And I found that over time people tend to appreciate having it, if not necessarily using it. Mm-hmm. Now, with with all that with all that in mind, uh, the, now obviously going through going through a lot of the history when it comes to heavy gear is it is going to be a daunting affair. And, I'm, and would it be fair of me to say that for this fourth edition, it's being built just as much for people just getting into it as it is for the as it is for the old hats? I would say that's fair. Um... It's kind of a little timeline scale here. The first edition of Heavy Gear came out in 96. It was followed up in 2008 by the second edition, which is really like a 1.5. It was like a one first edition revised almost. 2003 third edition came out. There were some substantive changes. Um, you could play it with a D20 if you wanted to. They added certain mechanics to it, and it wasn't super well received. That was the last release that the RPG had. Mm -hmm. That was 20 years ago. RPG tastes, players, and just the way that the industry works, there's a lot of lessons learned, there's a lot of stuff that's changed. People have distilled what they want out of a game more. It's easier for players to point to something and say, I want this, this, and this. So, yeah, going forward, we, we have to recognize that, number one, we can't necessarily, from a business perspective, just work off of a 20-year-old fan base. Mm-hmm. And B that yeah we got to get new people in there. Yeah, and this is this is where um, this is where this is where I find I find some things interesting because it's clear that this is still technically using the shil the Shilouette engine, but one of the more striking things I noticed is unless I'm misreading it, this version of the Shilouette engine is entirely skill-based. Um, as in we don't have attributes or anything like that? Yes. 
Congratulations. You're, every single person I've talked to about this doing like interviews has brought that up. Um, yes, we got rid of the attributes, which is a really strange decision at first. But there's a very good process that went behind it. Um, you want? Do we want to go into that story? Yeah. Okay. So I'm not. I'm going to assume most people who are listening to this have no idea how the old system worked. So allow me to explain how the old system worked. Your character had attributes, and there were ten of them. There were also five derived attributes, which were based off of things about your character. Um, in a D&D context, this would be things like, well, it'd be more like Pathfinder. It'd be like carry capacity and stuff like that. Then there was a skill list, and there were 75 skills on that skill list. Much like a D&D or a Pathfinder, each skill was associated with an attribute. And the way it worked was the skill rating you had was how many D6s you rolled to perform the skill test. So if I had a piloting skill of three, I rolled three D6. Mm -hmm. The attribute was a flat modifier at the, at the end of the roll to your final result. So, for example, that heavy gear piloting, the relevant skill was agility. If you had an agility of one... You would roll your skill worth of d6s, determine your result, and then add one at the end for the agility. And this is what the old system did. Now, on paper, this is fine. There's a couple of problems with it. And I want to point to, there's an example in the second edition book. And this example highlights everything that was great and everything that was disgustingly wrong with the system. So it compares two gear pilots. One has a skill of three and an agility of zero. That means the skill three, they roll their dice, and they get plus zero at the end. Mm -hmm. um, for those who aren't aware with how heavy gear dice work, um, you roll, and at the time, if you rolled a six, every additional six you rolled, add one. So if you rolled three dice and got six, 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 your result was actually an eight. So that adjustment of plus one minus one plus two minus two it actually could go as high as five was incredibly powerful on how this affected your skill roll now that skill three pilot with agility zero was compared to a skill one pilot with an agility of two and this is where things get a little bit screwy so the agility zero pilot um skill three represents somebody who's doing this full time Mm -hmm. Like that's a that's a trained soldier. Skill one is like hobbyist level. Like this is somebody who they got their gear and you know they're doing like the off roading occasionally with their friends every once in a while. Like mm -hmm. that's the level of skill that is. So this is where the the weirdness shows up. That agility zero pilot, if you go to the math curve, averages just over a five as their average roll. And the highest they can get is an 8. That will occur less than half a percent of the time. This is fine. Okay. The Agility 2 pilot, however, averages 5.5 and has an 8 17 percent of the time. That 2 points of Agility is more impactful than being trained at this skill. Just because this person is more agile. And... The way that the system worked, beating your opponent's roll mattered because it multiplied your damage. So one or two points of result on there completely changes the math. It goes from doing light damage to blowing the target to pieces if you're shooting them. And this, this skill one pilot with agility two is outperforming a trained combat soldier. And here's the thing about agility. Agility is the same skill you use for gymnastics. <laughs> yep. You're telling me that somebody who's an inherently good gymnast is better than a trained combat soldier for piloting a mech. Bullshit. <laughs> Plain and simple. That's bullshit. Now, in the book, they justify this saying that the Agility Zero pilot is more consistent. That's true, but they have a wider range of results. Because here's the thing about that Agility 2 pilot. It can never roll less than a 3. They roll a one, you get plus two to it. They got a three. It can never roll less than a three. The agility, the, the, the skill three guy can roll a one or a two. 
So that agility two, that skill three guy has a wider range. Yeah, it's a little more consistent, but it's over a wider range. So the end result's a little bit closer than you might think. Mm -hmm. And then they claim that, well, the agility zero one lets wild swings happen as heroic acts. Who the fuck cares about, like, that shouldn't be the, the, the fact that this person's an inherently agile, you know, gymnast. Like, that's what this is saying. Mm hmm if you break that down for a second, it makes no goddamn sense. Okay? So, right off the bat, we're coming in, we're looking at this system, and this, we just can't, like, this is patently absurd. This is something that, you know, the, all those who had played second edition, and, you know, because we have a few people who had, you know, talking to people, this just, this is ridiculous. Okay? Your inherent stat having that much of an impact on your skill role, so much so that you can overcome 10 to 15 years of training. No. Remember when I said Heavy Gear tries to be grounded and believable? <laughs> you want to know what just broke believable? That. Yeah. Okay. So, that right there set us up for the idea that the attribute system needs to change. Now, there's another problem that Heavy Gear had when it came to characters. And I don't have a visual here because this is an audio cast, but... If you go to one of our earliest books, uh, DreamPod 9006, is called Operation Jungle Drums. It was one of the first adventures ever published. Mm -hmm. There is a character in there by the name of Miranda Petit, and I redid her character sheet in the new edition for the RPG Kickstarter page. Her previous page is over two pages of information and somehow includes less detail than the new one. Because what you've got is you've got, like I said... 15, 10 attributes and 5 derived stats. The skill list, which her skill list had like 20-something things on it. Physical description, actual information, you need her equipment list, and then you have an entire page of who she is, how she acts, and what her personality is, so you can actually, you know, roleplay the character. Mm -hmm. you know, this is a roleplaying game, last I checked. You kind of want to roleplay the character. So, you get this giant number vomit for all intents and purposes and then you have an entire page of okay well you have to read all of this to figure out kind of who she is and how she acts this was initially two problems and we kind of came to the conclusion that we could potentially fix this by working in both so continuing the process sorry if i get rambly or need to stop just let me know no don't wor don't worry this, this sort of rambly is the kind of thing i expect okay so going back to the attributes in the extreme cases, a character that's skill 1 or a character that's skill 5, the, the two extremes at the end, it's okay to have a flat modifier to a roll. It's when characters have different skill levels that this flat modifier starts doing screwy, fucked up things. So that was where we came to the conclusion. It's like, okay, well, we can't really... We can't really have them be flat modifiers. The other thing that came up at about this time was, okay, these numbers are cool, but again, I want to emphasize this is a role-playing game. If I give you this giant stat block of numbers and say, sit out in a bar and talk to this person, do you have the information to do it? Can you explain to me the meaningful difference if this stat is one higher? How does that change your situation? When you've got 10 stats, 5 derived ones, and 75 skills... Um, that becomes a very hard question to answer. Mm -hmm. So that was the first step in the idea that saying, okay, well, we're going to keep attributes, but instead of them being numbers, we're going to actually record them as a narrative element. Instead of your character having a high agility score, they're a very lithe or leaf person, or however you pronounce that. Mm -hmm. So we're using a descriptor instead of a number. Now, all of a sudden, if you're talking to this person or encountering them or reading their character sheet... That's worth more than a thousand numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it's you know, uh, yeah. They say a picture's worth a thousand words, but a thousand, you know, a word's worth a lot of numbers. Um, in general, most characters tend to have four to five non-zero stats. So, of all those ten stats, most of you know, at least half of them were usually a zero. Mm -hmm. So we end up giving characters four traits, and we broke them into three categories: aptitudes, which are strictly bonuses. Adversities, which are strictly penalties, and quirks, which can go either way. And we did some playtesting around like how many times you can use them or whatever. But the big change to them was instead of adding a flat result, they added or removed dice from your roll. Mm -hmm. 
So instead of, yes, my Agile character adds three to my result, well, now your Agile aptitude adds 1d6 to your roll. It doesn't go as crazy. We did try it where it was adding more dice than just one. It gets a little bit screwy. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a imposed system where it is on the player for to the player to actually roleplay this. They don't have to like put on a funny accent, but to include kind of like in the description what they're doing. And I can pull up an example of that and read that if you would like. Kind of what we expect to see with that. Mm-hmm. But. That did lead us to also put in a passive set of perks and flaws, which between these two systems, much of the effect that you got out of having these attributes has been replaced with these. Instead of adding flat modifiers, they're adding dice, or they're manipulating dice or dice interactions. But just the the massive flat modifiers on rolls, they just went. And it did it in a way that actually has a, a, a narrative purpose behind it. So the perks and flaws ended up being more physical things, like this is where that high agility would have gone. Mm-hmm. You know, that there, there's a perk for that agile. The traits, like um, aptitudes, quirks, and adversities, those went to more kind of personality things as time went on. So, you know, you're playing a character who's competitive or hot-headed. Mm-hmm. And between those two, we found that actually putting a character sheet in front of somebody with that information, it's a lot easier for the DM to get a handle on what this character is going to be doing and how they're acting without having to spend paragraphs explaining it. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, a lot of adventure modules require a, um, a lot of extra stuff. Like, okay, I need XYZ pieces of information... Like, what is this character after? Who do they know? Things like that. And we we got all of that. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do it in a character sheet. So that was kind of where we went with that. Yeah, I can can get get behind that, certainly. Yeah, and and I want to add, there's a couple more things to it. There were those um, derived characteristics, Mm -hmm. which were things like, how much can this character lift, which was effectively carry weight. Um, hit points, things like that. Those are all still there. It just changed what's causing them. Um, The previous editions had something called archetypes. Archetypes were basically sample characters. They didn't actually really do anything. Aside from giving you the, like, this is the archetypical gear pilot. Great, cool. Um, We went a little bit further and made those into, like, full-on character classes to reflect different types of training. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's where stuff like I get bonus carry weight or whatever, that's where those are living. Yeah. And so you don't get a character who's like, I have extra hit points just because. Well, no, you're a trained infantryman. That's why you're you're getting a little bit of a bonus there. Mm-hmm. And in my ex- in my experience uh, the a lot of a lot of the a lot of the attribute skill cent- centric games that came ar- that came around in the two thousands. Oh, there was a lot of stuff that they did right, but there was one trap that a lot of them fell into, and that is um, analysis paralysis, mm-hmm. where where there's so, where you end up going so freeform that it's that um unless you have a degree of system mastery already, it's hard to say whether where you're. Uh, where you should really start. Mm-hmm. So, Heavy Gear 2E has that, and I'm going to be flat honest, our, our new edition has that too, to an extent, because we're asking you to make character-level decisions that have a mechanical impact. Um, I don't know if you're familiar much with, like, Vampire the Masquerade. I am. Okay. Character creation in that isn't just numbers. You have to actually create your character's story and who they are. Like, that's a relevant part of character creation. That holds true for the new edition of Heavy Gear. So if you're someone who's, you know, when they think, a lot of people, when they think of, okay, well, I want to build a character, they're going into the numbers, they're going into the math, they're going into the stats. Heavy Gear says, hold on. You can do that, but you are going to have to make decisions about what nation is this person from. Because that has a mechanical effect. You know, you've got these aptitudes, quirks, and adversities. We provide a list of, of, of ones, but you can 
if you have have one that's not on that list, that's okay. Like, there's not a fixed set of these. It's you creating this aspect of your character's personality. And to help with that, we try and provide as much support and examples as we can. So in the rulebook, we have, um, I think it's like eight or nine sample characters. One of every single archetype. Mm -hmm. And you can see different types of aptitudes, quirks, and adversities. They tend to be very, like, one word, couple very descriptive words. You know, just looking through here, you know, this character is creative. This character is jaded. This character has an iron will. Um, this character, you know, is a focused introvert or whatever. Those are the kinds of things that go there. We have a, like, four-page list of, like, a like a hundred, like, a couple hundred of them to go through. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of analysis paralysis. And it's because we're asking you to go through and say, okay, you have to make a, a character decision. You know, a lot of, this is something that, Okay, little minor rant here. A lot of people have played like a D&D or a Pathfinder. Okay? Mm -hmm. How many times have you played in a DD and d campaign and the lawful good paladin participates or allows the group to go rob somebody? No. Or... This is, that's where you end up with the problem class issue, a.k.a. lawful stupid. Lawful stupid. Or um, my favorite is chaotic asshole. Where they're just doing, they're, they're playing a video game and they're letting their character do things that no reasonable character in that situation would actually do. Yeah, the LOL random kind kind of person who claim who um, whenever they get whenever they get called out and they will get called out, um, mm -hmm. says they're just playing their alignment. They're playing their alignment or something like that, and it's like you're you're not. You also aren't playing an alignment. It's not called an alignment sheet. It's called a character sheet. So you get this situation where there's the character's personality and the player is expected to play that character to that personality. Our system, because of these quirks, attributes, and things like that, you have to play your character to their personality. But that means you have to figure that out. And yeah, the first time I run somebody through character creation with this game, it takes a little bit. I wouldn't say it takes much longer than a new person to any RPG, like, if you've ever taught somebody who's never really RPG'd before how to play D&D, &D, like, that character creation process, it, it's kind of like that, where, yeah, I'm asking you, with this game, to come up with a character, not a block of numbers and equipment. Mm -hmm. So, sorry. Any, anyway, back to the, to the analysis paralysis. We have a different kind, um, and we try, we try so hard to give just as many examples and processes, and like, okay... Um, here's examples, situations. Um, like I said, there's like eight sample character sheets in there. The NPCs have all of them. Like, we're trying to help as much as possible, but we understand that you know, if you've never done a game like this where you have to make a character, again, you know, compared to Vampire, because that's probably one of the more common ones in that vein. Mm -hmm. It it takes a little bit the first time. And when it com now when it comes to one, it it's funny that we mentioned BattleTech early because one particular issue that can cr that can crop up is where is um where you have a setting that's so detailed that there that there isn't really a spot for the pl for the player characters to put themselves in. Mm -hmm. Um. BattleTech is not the is not the big is not the biggest offender, but it is one of the bigger ones when it comes to this. So yeah. with he with heavy gear, um, I realize I realize you could that one could easily go with the whole thing of of the player characters are just mercenaries. But what are what are some of the other um, entry points for part for parties that you've you that you've used yourself? So one thing that um, we want to, we like to emphasize with Heavy Gear is we are a sci-fi franchise. We have giant robots. They have big guns. That doesn't mean you have to play this game solely within a military context. context. Mm -hmm. In our rulebook, we actually have a section, and it's one thing that you know we do a little bit differently. I've seen this in other games. I'm not saying it's unique to us, but 
we actually have the team, the group of players, we call it a team, is actually an entity in the game. Like, you as a group share resources, get access to equipment and all of that through a collective grouping. And we provide a number of samples of different types of teams, what kinds of things that they would go out and be doing, what kind of logistics they're going to have. So you can go through and pick. Instead of being a bunch of mercenaries, you could be a, you know, survivors of, you know, some massacre or whatever. You can be an expedition of scientists and their escorts out to go, you know, uncover something in the wastelands. You could be a bunch of arena jocks who are, you know, racing or whatever, trying to get a head up on their competition. That may spiral into some other stuff. The, the game doesn't lock you into this, but it's kind of that initial stepping off point. You know, we, we want you to go through and actually pick this team dynamic. It, it actually, in the rules, has to happen before character creation. So that you're kind of all on that same page. Mm -hmm. And they're not all military, not by a long shot. Yeah, this this is one of those things that I'll, I'll bring up because it can get it's easy to get kind of lost in the weeds with this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's so that's why it's important to have a potential um, entry point, um, or in some case in some cases several. I mean, you're dealing with a with a large world with a lot with a lot of di with a lot of different factions, mm -hmm. and. I'm guessing that even even within the even within the numerous factions, um, you can kind you can kind of ease people in through the through the league system that is throughout Terra Nova. Yeah. So the the thing about Terra Nova is it's a planet that's slightly smaller than Earth. It has like one fourteenth of the population. Like Terra Nova has maybe five million people on it. On a planet the size of the Earth. Okay. You know, pick a large country in the real world. You know, let's say like Canada. Canada is smaller than the smallest nation in heavy gear. But it has four times the population of the nation I'm thinking of. So what ends up happening is you get very, very isolated groups forming together. What that means from a player perspective, trying to, you know, get their characters a footing in the world is you can kind of almost do anything and it would make reasonable sense within the world. Mm -hmm. Your character can come from pretty much any nation and be in any other nation's, like, military organization. It's not that crazy. Yeah, there, there's some, you know, it might beg credulity, but... It's so open-ended that you, you could put pretty much anybody in any situation. Um, we do have a area of the world that's kind of specifically designed for that. It's called the Badlands. Mm -hmm. So Heavy Gear takes place on a world called Terra Nova. I already mentioned that. The thing about Terra Nova is it's a little bit closer to its sun than Earth is. So there's a snow cap on the North Pole. But as you move south, it turns into alpine forests, grasslands... You get to the equator, you get a thousand kilometer deep desert, and then the South Pole goes towards tropical jungle at the pole. Mm -hmm. So that band of desert in the middle, um, calling it the Wild West would imply some level of consistent civilization. But it is kind of that place where if you've seen like a, a like a Western movie or something like that, it's that open frontier where it's your community and there may not be anywhere else. You can tell pretty much any story within that. You, know, you, you can be from wherever you want and pretty much do whatever you want within that. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty good jumping off point. You know, If you're a new group or, or a new GM or trying to get your characters going, just start them off in a little village in the Badlands. You can do anything. You can be anybody. Yeah. And I suppose, I suppose in that regard, if I had to bring in um, BattleTech players for a comparison. I could, I could, e I could easily bring in um, the periphery as a parallel. To an extent, yeah. The thing about the periphery, though, is going back into the inner sphere is a little bit hard. Mm -hmm. You know, being yes, we're in the middle of nowhere. Now go to you know New Avalon. That's a pretty substantial jump in BattleTech. Yeah. 
In heavy gear, leagueless hobo going to major capital is called Monday. <laughs> like you, there, there, you don't have to contrive anything or anything like that. It doesn't get weird. Because mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I'm familiar with BattleTech, and yeah, the periphery is is that wild is that wasteland, but it's so far away from everything else that people don't always end up there, and people don't always leave there. There's al- Whereas, there's also the fact that because of that distance, you c- that's the that's part of the reason why you could have the kind of friction that is pr- is present where the whole thing of hey we we want to re- we want to unite every we want to reunite everybody and the periphery says politely no thank you mm-hmm. and I mean it's like what do you do about that mm-hmm. I mean that was the whole Star League thing in BattleTech. Yeah, you know, they they tried and it didn't work because there's still a periphery out there. And the mot- as I understood it, the motif when it came to heavy gear was Terra Nova used to be part used to be one colony of me- of many for a inter- for an interstellar government based on Earth. They tried they things went south. A lot of the colonies ended up having to fend for themselves. Terra Nova, di- Terra Nova was no exception. It did pretty well for itself. Then Earth came back, and w- then Earth's representatives came back and were like, "We want to, we want to bring this back into being a colony." Terra Nova was had stopped fighting each other for a, for a moment be- to shoot to shoot at the guys coming in and say and say screw off. And years later, the, um, Earth is coming back. Um, yeah, that that's the gist of it. Um, so I think one, I think one of the, this is a this is something that ends up getting brought up. I remember get, getting brought up quite a bit whenever a new edition of Legend of the Five Rings came out, as far as advancing the story. I'm guessing that I'm guessing that when it comes to the timeline end, end of things, that hasn't changed too much. Um, we're advancing the storyline a little bit from the last publication that did. The last publication that advanced the storyline was in 2011. Mm-hmm. So it's been a little bit before we need to go on. Um, we're not trying to set up like a, a point of eternal conflict or anything like that. Um, we, there is a story being told. There is a meta narrative behind it, but we're just trying to move it along and let people experience the world through that. Oh. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Oh. Um. Uh, uh, I do want to, if I, if I can chime in real fast, uh, one thing on scale. Um, the the scale of Heavy Gear's universe, there's only ten planets. There's Earth, and there's nine, there are nine former colonies. Mm-hmm. That's it. So, you don't get, you know, like, keep going back to Battletech here. Battletech has thousands of planets. You, know, you can make one up. Whereas Heavy Gear is like, okay, now here's here's the world we've got. You've got ten planets. You can visit all of them. They're all there. But, yeah, I just want to drop in on the scale right there where it's like, we're not talking a huge universe here. Yeah, especially, especially since you mentioned that ti- that um, interstellar travel is more is more based on wormholes or jump or jump points than anything else. Mm-hmm. So they're called gates. They're naturally occurring wormholes. Excuse me. They only go to and from one place. Mm -hmm. So there is a gate. If you go through the gate, you will always end up in the same place. If you turn around, you'll go back to where you started. It's an instant jump. But it does mean that there's a network of travel. Like there are planets that sit at a hub of different gates. And they have more strategic relevance. Discovering gates is a big deal because you kind of just have to go around shooting a laser at random points in space to find them. Mm-hmm. But it, yeah, it also does mean that you know we can have Earth try and reconquer all of its colonies and actually have a strategy behind it. You know, we take this world, then this world, then this world. Now all of the colonies are completely isolated from each other. And I'm get and to that to the, to that end, even though by default it's take the 
fourth edition rule rule set is taking place in um, TN 1954. Uh, I get the feeling that there's no, there wouldn't be too much stopping someone from using what's in fourth edition along with along with past material to run a campaign that takes place earlier. So all of the old material for first and second edition mm -hmm. is compatible with fourth edition. Mm -hmm. The adventure structures poured over basically exactly. Um, the equipment change, the combat system change, and then there's the character adjustments, but it's all fully compatible and it doesn't take that long. Yeah. The timeline thing, though, um, with our Kickstarter, we have adventure modules added to it. And they're adventure modules for an RPG. They pretty much do exactly what you think it is. Mm -hmm. um, the thing about those, though, is none of them, except for the first stretch goal one, is set concurrent with the RPG in the timeline. All of them are in the past. They serve as a way to kind of experience the un the history of the universe, and then there's ways to segue it forward. But the game doesn't necessarily date itself, or you know, it doesn't necessarily lock itself into a very specific time period. You can play the older stuff. You can play 300 years in the past if you want. Mm -hmm. As a bit of a, as a bit of a follow up in that regard, um, earlier we earlier we had talked about how. The how the um the support craft that's that you would see in most fights tends to get overlooked in something like say Gundam. Mm -hmm. uh, in that in that same vein, because uh, I I'm a big fan of Titanfall two, and one of the big things with that is you have infantry and mechs fight fighting in the same skirmishes. Mm -hmm. Within with with the way silhouette works, um. Uh, could somebody reasonably um, do th do that kind of scenario? So one of the things with the new edition we had to do was the combat system from second edition had to be converted to the new version of the war game, or at least something similar to it. The new version of the war game puts infantry and tanks and aircraft and gears all on the same battlefield with the same rule set. So to answer your question, it's designed to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you're also the game is not built under the assumption that players are always taking the giant robot too. If you want to play a character that doesn't use a gear, that's totally fine. You know, be careful because if you get into a, fight, a shooting match with a tank, the tank is probably going to win. Mm -hmm. Like you're a human, no amount of training and shenanigans is going to let you win a face-on fight with a tank in the middle of the street. You take one round and you are gone. Mm -hmm. But we don't make a distinction between combat on foot, combat in a vehicle, or even air. You want to do aircraft. Um, we had a we had a beta test campaign that they started with a car chase that evolved into a fist fight that turned into a sword fight between giant robots that spilled over onto an airport and ended with two attack helicopters dancing in the middle of the streets trying to shoot each other down. And at no point in that sequence of events do you have to stop and say, okay, we're going to convert to the vehicle combat now. Mm -hmm. And during this time, you know, there's people involved at all steps of this who are still running around and doing this. As the attack helicopters are running around, there's one guy chasing them in a car, and then there's a couple people sitting in an apartment complex going, great, now what? Mm -hmm. Like The game doesn't break because of that. It's designed to do that. That kind of thing is, cer is certainly good to know. Now, putting aside putting aside um, any any poten any potential or future stretch goals, because there's always the possibility of str of of having to add new stretch goals if you run if you run out of the ones present. Not saying that's going to happen or the, or that it has or or not. It's just I've seen I've seen it happen. But what are you shooting for as far as the page count for the final book? So the final book is 480 pages. Mm -hmm. It is all done in layout. I actually, I could go through right now, drop in existing art assets, and send this off to a printer tomorrow. Like it, it is that state. Our Kickstarter is to recover the development costs, and then also get a budget to pay for new art. Mm -hmm. I've got about 250 slots for new art. 
So the more money we get through Kickstarter, the more art we're getting in there. It's roughly about, I think that first goal was going to get us about 75 to 80 pieces. Mm -hmm. Once we recouped all the costs and everything. So going forward, yeah, we've got more art to fill in. Um, we do have other stuff available, like our stretch goals have mostly been additional adventure modules. Mm -hmm. um, I am not in danger of running out of adventure modules anytime soon. Um, I've got 17 of them sitting around still yeah. that are like not just like words on a like a name like all those adventure modules we have in our kickstarter those exist and are playable right now mm -hmm. um and then of course you know we get far enough like we are gonna do an expansion book at some point <laughs> yeah and the i oh. think i think one of the big uh, things that that i'm curious about and you get you you may have already brought this up but do you plan on do you plan on putting out some sort of companion that's meant to be a conversion guide for um, bringing material from second edition over into fourth? That's in the core book. All right. Like I said, like I said, there's no there's no way I can go I can go through 400 pages in the in the span of two in the span of two or three days. So you're fine. You're <laughs> fine. It is in the it is in the core book. Mm -hmm. Um, the conversion is mostly just for characters. Mm hmm. Because when it comes to equipment, you just use the new equipment rules. It's fine. When it comes to vehicles, you have to use the new vehicle rules. That's fine. The adventure structure, completely unchanged. Mm -hmm. Like, very, very minor modifications. The only thing you have to really do to convert content over is the characters. So, we have the character converter in the core book. Um, that conversion for Miranda that I mentioned um you can see her character sheet on the Kickstarter page. That took me five minutes of work. It took me 20 minutes overall, but that's because I had to put it in InDesign and then output a PDF. Like, that took longer than actually making it. Mm -hmm. And I, and I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing that. Seeing that. Um, what are you guys shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, but a general ballpark. It is our intention to have this thing shipped out if you're getting a hard copy in time for the holidays. And for P for PDFs for PDFs around October, that would probably be reasonable. Um, I think what we're going to do is I don't remember the exact details right off the top of my head, but I think the plan was to put the PDF out as soon as we have approved a print copy, mm -hmm. and then in that case, it's like okay, here's the PDF. We've put the orders in for the hard copies. Go. Right, that pretty pr sense. pretty much every pledge level gets you a, a digital copy of the book. Mm -hmm. yeah, I and I will I will like I said before I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Oh, that's totally fine. Thank you for having me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I I have been drinking while we've been doing this, so. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be I'm plenty so more. You had to deal with me. <laughs> and there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!